I go undercover in the film into a pig farm and I was shocked by how much that affected me. When you look into the eyes of a pig, they're almost human-like. A key thing as well for us was how do we communicate in a way that people will be receptive to? Just a handful of companies control the sectors and when they have such a monopoly on distribution and production then they have power and as George Mobio says in the film sometimes these organisations have more power than many governments. So my guest today is Thomas Pickering and he's the director of the hotly anticipated documentary I Could Never Go Vegan. So Thomas, for those listening and for watching, are you all right to just introduce yourself and tell our viewers a little bit about what you do? Hi, well, uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, uh, first and foremost. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so my name's uh, Tom Pickering. I'm a director and editor and we're in the really exciting position at the moment where we have our documentary coming out at cinemas all across the UK. Uh, so the premiere will be on April 10th in London, Soho, and the following day there's a premiere in Sheffield because I'm based up north and I'd like to you know, not forget about the northerners. And then from the 19th, we're rolling out nationwide. And then from there on, we'll be announcing various other territories worldwide and um, what kind of streaming platform it will be available on from uh, the cinema release onwards. Brilliant. That's great news. Um, like Thomas, you actually grew up vegetarian, didn't you? Yeah, so I quite an interesting upbringing in the sense that I uh, have never eaten meat. So, And that's kind of the catalyst for the documentary itself and for uh, kind of what started this whole journey and the process. So I one day was basically questioning whether this was, well, why my parents raised me this way for starters. And then I got chatting with my brother who, my brother James is a, a writer and producer. He actually made the film with me. And I was like, you know, I don't actually know why why I was brought up this way. <laughs> uh, it's just always become a thing where it was it was kind of accepted. And, um, and then obviously later on in life, I became very passionate about it myself but and then went vegan eventually but I was trying to think back to what it must what it was like for me as a kid and you know what I would say to friends when they asked me and I couldn't even remember and so <laughs> uh, that kind of prompted me to to ask my mum that and which I do in the film and then that takes me on a journey of exploring why people always use this phrase I could never go vegan and it's followed with you know because and then various reasons and so I'm kind of exploring whether they, these arguments are justified or not. And it's integrated with my own story in there, which hopefully provides a nice personal angle. So that really just took us on this four-year journey. No, it's brilliant. I mean, your mum's kind of the hidden star, I think, of the documentary, you know, when she's on the phone and talking about people thinking that you're going to pass out and they were worried about your health and things like that. And it, it's it's funny because it is that was like people's main concerns, especially in you know the eighties and nineties as well. Yeah, it's. I mean, it was a strange time then, especially <laughs> if people if people say to me they think it's hard to be vegan now. I I would say imagine growing up in the eighties and nineties as a vegetarian that was hard. Like there was literally nothing. It, the the word vegetarian tended to scare people back then. And if you if I went around to a friend's house, it was basically like oh I'll. Um, I'll make you an omelette or it had to be something still with animal products in because people just couldn't comprehend that food, a meal would exist without any animal products. So it's so much, so much easier now. So it always does make me laugh if people say it's just too difficult to go vegan. Oh, I know. It's true. It it was come such a long way. I mean, with your documentary as well, you've, you did a really great job of getting loads of different people, um, this it's such a you know di- it covers literally every topic you know as to why people don't want to go vegan basically and you got people like Sophia Ellis and Dr Gemma Newman and how for you when you were looking at these individuals how did you go about kind of selecting them and looking for their stories? Yeah it was really important to us that it, it was a good representation of um, the vegan movement in general but especially um what Britain looks like these days and like you know it was an accurate representation of that so we wanted like this wonderful diverse cast people from all walks of life showing how accessible veganism is Uh, and basically what we did was whatever the argument was so let's say it was um, you know where would I get my protein we would uh, effectively assess like what do we need to say in order to answer this or debunk this or find out the relevant information that we need 
And so then that would take us to either doctors, nutritionists, or maybe towards athletes. And so we'd find the people who could answer these questions and they really are like the best of the best. So it wasn't, it's not just like me saying my opinion, because, you know, what does that, what does that matter really? So we were finding the people who, who actually could answer these and could provide the, the scientific knowledge behind why it is the way it is and, and give us accurate information. And the the wonderful thing in the vegan movement is when you reach out to someone and you kind of tell them the project, what it is you're wanting to do, nearly every single person said yes in a heartbeat. It's like, yeah, would love to be involved. Just let me know where you need me, that kind of thing. And so we really didn't have that much difficulty getting hold of people. Like I can count on one hand the amount of people that didn't want to be in the film. And usually that was because of other reasons like a schedule clash or something. So... It all started with the with the arguments, and then that basically led us to find out who was the professional in that field that would be able to you know, effectively tell us what we needed to know. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I love the fact that you had um, oh, who was it? Who was running Paul Yard, and then you had Ian Tolhurst. Um, yeah. And and it is so like broad as well. What you like, you know, he's talking about something I consider to be criminal. You know, the the way that the government subsidiaries prop up meat and dairy, but not arable farming and. He, he goes into kind of like how farmers are kind of being ripped off as well at the hands of supermarkets and all these like issues that are, are kind of outside of the vegan world as well that I think a lot of people could probably relate to. Yeah, that was a really fascinating area as well. So obviously because I've been part of this lifestyle for a long time, I felt like I knew a fair bit, I would say. But the, the area where I really learned yeah, when we were making this film was the environmental right. section. So, and particularly with regards to like government subsidies and how much money is just pumped into animal agriculture and not um, plant-based agriculture and crop farming and that kind of thing. And and you're right, it does seem criminal. It's uh, And that's why uh, effectively you can pay, or on occasions, you can pay less for four ultra-processed beef burgers than you can for four apples which just doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> yeah, it's so, crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because sometimes you find that the um, fruits and veg, uh, they can actually be much cheaper, and that is often the case as well. But certain fruits in particular, we found, like, they really can just cost you more than meat. And then we wonder why there's only something like 13% of children eating enough portions of fruit and veg a day in the UK. And <laughs> then you, you really kind of have to address these subsidies that are just being thrown around and propping up a... a pretty much a broken food system. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. It was really hard actually to get questions together for this because every part, every second of the film is really brilliant. And there were times when I was like moved, which I didn't expect to be because, you know, you see quite a lot and you think you're kind of aware of things, but there's times when you moved like to sadness, to actual fury. Um <laughs> And like, you know, when you're like talking, when you're looking into this and you are obviously doing all of the interviews and the research, you know, when you're looking at like ocean dead zones and the amounts of animal cruelty. I mean, how did you manage like the emotions, you know, when you were learning about all of this and kind of going into it? Yeah, it w I mean, parts of it went easy, I'll be honest. Yeah. Uh, two parts in particular. So I go undercover in the film into a pig farm and I was shocked by how much that affected me. Because you kind of think, I, I was trying to rationalise in my head and think, well, at least I'm not going into a slaughterhouse at this stage. But actually, it was possibly worse because I had no idea just how bad the conditions were. And really, I didn't know much about the three different phases of pigs in a, in that, a farm in that position. And particularly the farrowing crates, where is for people who don't know, where basically the mum is just locked up in a crate where they can't move at all. They can't turn around, they're locked in position for pretty much five to seven weeks uh, at a time. Then they have a litter of piglets, they feed their piglets. So many of them get crushed because the mum just can't move and the pigs just get caught underneath and all sorts. Uh, then released for a short time and then um, inseminated artificially the process re is like repeated and um, it's an awful existence like and the thing with pigs when you look into the eyes of a pig they're almost human like they're like probably the main animal i think that we can truly relate to that's farmed uh, and that's not to say it's any better in other parts of the farming industry it's just that there's something about pigs when you look at a pig and i don't know it just it really gets you so that part stuck with me. Uh, still to this day, like I, you know, I, I literally can see that pig so clearly. And there's a shot in the film which 
Uh, if people go watch it, they'll they'll know exactly what I mean as soon as they see it. And then the uh, the when it came to like the undercover slaughterhouse footage, I put that off for so long, like I just didn't want to edit it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, it, it I was totally blame you. And um, it got to a point where I was like, ah, the thing is, I I, I kind of rationalised in my head by saying, if I'm struggling to even put this together, imagine what it's like going through it. Like I can't begin to imagine, and that's the thing. And so I just kept telling myself that that there's a big, a much bigger picture here. Like you know, people need to be aware of this. They need to see this. I'm just going to have to get it done and um, try and find the right balance as well. So that was a key thing. We wanted to place the welfare section uh, a nice time where people had sort of invested in the documentary, so we don't open up with it. It's a good hour before we get to it, and then we wanted to make sure we didn't go so extreme with it that people would turn off because we needed to show just enough so people are aware but not enough that they think oh no this is just not for me and I, ho- I hope we got that balance right but I mean it's it's hard it's always going to be difficult watching stuff like that because you know it's horrible what's happening but again I go back to if it's difficult to watch just imagine going through it I think he did a I do honestly think he did a really good job of it I mean you start it's quite like slow at the start you know you introduce your dog and you you know you, you're very uh, likable and people can relate to you and it's just it does hit that one hour mark and you're like oh lord this is just horrible isn't it and it <laughs> but but you you know you're right and the slaughterhouse workers you know when they're talking about the sort of the blades and things like that it's like you know, even as vegans who are aware of this, you're like, oh God, yeah, the reality sort of hits home, doesn't it? And it's, it it makes you just think, you know, with the pigs and the firing crates, the wiener pigs and like the fattening pens and all of that, you just kind of think, oh, how can you justify that but bacon argument? You know, it's... Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is... I think the thing is, once you, once you find veganism and then once you become really passionate about this way of life, which most vegans do, it's hard... To, to remember what it was like before and all you want to do is try and help people see things the way you you see things now and that, this is certainly how I feel and so a, a key thing as well for us was how do we communicate in a way that people will be receptive to and not so they're not just putting uh, you know barriers up and saying no you, you know I don't I'm, I'm not interested I don't want you preaching towards me and stuff and it's like you know we're not preaching I'm we wanted to sh- to actually showcase the information in as objective a way as possible because there's certain things in this film as well. When you see it, I mean, I didn't need to say anything in addition to what was being shown. And I was like, look, if you believe this is, is right and ethical and humane, then I really don't know what to say about that because I think <laughs> yeah. sometimes you, you look at certain things and, and you just know. You know it's wrong. You know that it's unacceptable and you know that it needs to change. And so we try to be clever about how we position that because then it's like presenting the information and the viewer is left to make up their mind. And hopefully that way it feels a little less like we're saying you need to do this and more like, can you believe this This exists? And then they think, yes, I need to change. I need to change something. I think, it, yeah, I think you do get that balance just right. And, you know, you you, you present the facts in a really accessible way as well. You know, as these things are kind of playing out. You're also, you're just talking about it, you know, that oh, when people are talking about buying organic, for example, you talk about like 98.3% of US pig factory farming. You know, that's the percentage of how much is factory farmed and over 75% in the EU are in commercial holdings. And it's like, oh, hang on, is the meat that I'm buying actually organic? You know, it it, it is getting people to just question the things they've been told, I think. Yeah, I think so. And and that's the main thing. Um, there's so much misinformation out there. And also we're, we're conditioned from such a young age to believe that what we're doing is right. And so it's, again, going back to it, it's just presenting that information so people can actually realise, you know, we're not saying you're a bad person for how you've been living your life now. We're just giving the information so actually you can make up your mind whether you feel like you, you need to change now going forward because we perhaps thought one thing and now we're, every day we're learning that it's really not it's really not what we thought it was and um yeah some of the i mean some of the stats like the transportation as well so the in terms of like the impact on climate change uh, for transportation of goods it's tiny it's so tiny you know as, as some studies suggest as small as like one percent uh so when people use that as a factor of saying well i only buy you know organic local beef 
that's from the UK, it's like, well, it really makes very, very little difference. If if your motivations are purely environmental, that's just not good enough. <laughs> you know, it's like what what's happening with um, in terms of like the, the methane and the emissions produced through just raising the animals is far, far greater. And then there's things like the, the use of land and people will talk about grazing and I mean, we we're, we're lucky we got to um, spend so much time with George Monbiot, who is just such an expert when it comes to the environment. And, and he'd just written his book. Um, so we, we got him at like, the perfect time because he was just equipped with uh, studies and stats and he just reeled them off. He didn't need to prepare anything and it was incredible, actually. But um, he talks a lot about the so-called regenerative grazing and how you know there's no such thing. It's just a buzzword. And basically, um, if... New Zealand's a good example because they're they're big on grazing for their cows, and if uh, if we all ate the typical diet of a New Zealander, we'd need multiple planets just to feed everyone. You know that's how much land it takes up, <laughs> so it's it's just not sustainable. Like it is literally not sustainable, and so things like that I think will hopefully resonate with a lot of people and and you know hit home in terms of okay yeah we need to change. I mean he was brilliant. Just you could he could just talk for an hour and you'd just be captivated by him and. He'd... What was it he was saying? Oh, I'm trying to remember. It was like a third of the entire world's land mass is used for farming, but it only gives something like, is it 18% of calories provided yeah. from that? Yeah, it's, just... it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And the thing is, it's the same with, yeah, if you look at sort of the um, uh, fishing industry as well, and farmed fish in particular. So people don't often think about fish as being farmed, but farmed fish are given a ridiculous amount of calories um, compared to the amount of calories they would provide in terms of food. Like, they're given way more calories just to feed them to then, you know, feed fewer calories to people, humans eating them. It makes absolutely no sense. It's such a a backwards uh, model in terms of production. And then it it kind of all leads back to the subsidies and how the industry would collapse without government subsidies. And then you're sort of asking yourself, but why are we allowing, why are we subsidising it then? Like, why aren't we trying to address this issue? But obviously, it goes it goes much deeper, and which we we do explore as well in the film that just a handful of companies basically control the sectors, and when they have such a monopoly on distribution and production, then they have power. And as George Mobio says in the film, sometimes these organisations have more power than many governments. Like that is how powerful they are. So it's not an easy thing to to fix, but as long as we can raise awareness of these issues and rally up people and let their voices be heard and demand change, then hopefully we can make a difference. I think so. I mean, and when you realise that it's all interlinked, you know, when you... I think, was it Randall Plunkett, maybe? He was talking about the rewilding, but that kind of... Which is great, but that comes against the fact that, you know, you don't even think about the kind of literal chicken shit, you know, like you, you kind of pointed out from the farms that... Yes. We're destroying all the protective uh, rivers, like the River Wye, and and it's just like when you make the connection, you know, it's not just um, it's not just the horrid treatment and murder and slaughter of animals. You, you've also you're looking at the kind of twenty out of twenty seven antibiotics that are vital for people being pumped into into these animals, and then the the knock on effect of that. It's it felt like quite all encompassing, doesn't it? It's like oof. well, the you know. The- Probably what I'm most proud of with the film is the way we um, pulled this narrative together in um, how one area connects to another, connects to another, and, and so on it goes. And then the way we tried to conclude the film, we almost like inverted this idea of the circle of life and we show how it starts and then go th- through the entire journey in an animal's life, but then how it affects all these other areas and then come to this end moment. And I don't want to give too much away about that because I'm, I'm really happy with how we managed to piece that bit together. And um, I think that even just in itself, I'm hoping like if we could just show people that, they would realise how absurd the, the current way of living is and the, the meat industry in general and like what we're doing as humans to the planet. And so, yeah, I'm really, really pleased with that. And I think, well, we spent a lot of time and my brother in particular, so he actually, we came up with a story together which is another thing. Some people don't realise that you kind of have to draft a story and a screenplay for a documentary, but because it was hmm. such a huge task, this, and we knew we wanted to cover so many areas, we needed a very concise screenplay that took us from A to B and so on. And yeah, I think my brother did a fantastic job in, in piecing that part together so that 
it does really take you on that journey and it's quite clear that something way over here that we spoke about an hour ago still affects uh, yeah. things that are happening in terms of like um, planetary health or even our own health if it comes to antibiotic resistance and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what people think of, of that part and how we put it together. No, I think it's I think it's great. And, you know, you, you've got a lot of serious subject matter, but I did I did laugh a couple of times. I think it was uh, when you asked what the hell are the Canadians doing? Is it like 43% or something? Would rather eat bacon than have sex? And you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? yeah. <laughs> How are Canadians doing sex? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, badly, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it yeah, was, the... what else? <laughs> Go on. No, there's a few stats like that that surprise me. I mean, it was important because it can be a very serious subject matter. Well, we wanted to make sure we, we offered light relief where we could and it was hopefully humorous in places as well, um, just to try and balance it. Again, it's all about that balance and it was also the placement of where we where we put certain sections within the film. But yeah, that, that kind of does start. As soon as we read that, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, that's got to be in the film. <laughs> Definitely. I did laugh a lot at that. And it was uh, you also did a really good job as well of dismissing the oh, men who eat soya get man boobs and, you know, it makes women... Cr- I like that as well. It was just like, okay, let's just quickly debunk that as, you know, straight away. Yeah, good. I'm glad I'm Ooh. glad to hear that. It was the same with the the canine argument and everything because uh, there's, there's things we wanted to address, but we knew we couldn't spend too long on them, so we just had to try and be creative in how we could get through certain bits quickly. And um, some of them were nice to try and add an element of humour just because... it. It helps the flow and then it keeps it quite entertaining as well. That's great. I mean, one of the things I really enjoyed is, well, I enjoyed is a bit of a strange word. I had no idea about is we hear a lot about B12, omega, proteins, but I didn't realise that um, there was such a kind of uh, deficiency in fibre. And I think it was like, because you were saying that we depend on meat and ger- dairy and junk food and processed food, like that gives 60 to 80% of calories now and that like one in five people in the US are now deficient in fibre and one in 10 in the UK and that that shocked me, yeah. Yeah, um, so no, it's, it's um, only one in 10 get enough fibre. Um, so like it's absolutely insane the amount of uh, fibre deficiencies. Um, and yeah, so Dr. Alan Desmond has a, a great section on this and he's a, a wealth of knowledge as well. Um, but that's he kind of looks at it as that's the thing we should be talking about is fibre deficiency because it's linked with so many conditions as well. Like you think of any kind of major health condition and uh, fibre deficiency is likely linked with it. And yet people talk about protein deficiency where pretty much nobody in the West ever would have protein deficiency. Like as long as you eat enough calories, you'll get enough protein in the West. So it's just trying to help people think differently about things and protein's obviously a great one where we're conditioned from a young age to think that oh, you can only get protein from animal products, which, of course, we know now is absurd. But would you believe some people still think this? So yeah. so we'd, we needed to make sure we addressed it. No, and you did a good job. I mean, the film, you know, you can you can learn a lot whether you've been vegan or vegetarian or pescatarian for a long time or if you're completely coming into this with no kind of thought that's been given before, you know, um, to any of these kind of considerations. But yeah, I, one thing that struck me though, like you were talking about how uh, veganism in the UK and Europe and uh, the US is booming and it, it definitely is. But in the US, is it true that there's more people now that are actually eat, consuming meat than before? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's a little bit depressing really. So yeah. veganism is obviously on the rise. And in the UK... Uh, meat consumption is declining but in the US it's the complete opposite yeah it's rising which I think probably has something to do with again with government subsidies and the fact that these um, these products are still being put on supermarket shelves and um, because the government's funding it and the government's allowing it and uh, it's almost like running side by side with the, the rise in, in veganism which is obviously quite worrying it, given yeah. that you'd assume more people are getting calories from plant-based foods over there now and yet still meat consumption is increasing so something clearly needs to change there and again hopefully this film can raise a bit of awareness for that and and inspire some sort of change yeah i hope so as well 
I, you've, um, I was just reading up as well. You've got some like heavy hitters uh, involved with this. You've got uh, like Alicia Silverstone, Alyssa White Gloves, Heather Mills, Peter Egan, as well as producers. I mean, how did you kind of get in touch with them? And did, you know, did any of their perspectives kind of influence any of the messaging or direction in the film? Yeah, so it's interesting, really. So there's there's two when it comes to EPs on films. There's there's two ways of doing it, really. So you have some EPs who actually like financially back you, and you have others who are, will attach to the project because they're really passionate about the cause and they want to help promote it for you and go and do public speaking for you, that kind of thing. And so with regards to um, the four that you mentioned there, we. Um, we actually attached them sort of in the later stages of the film in a help to kind of promote and reach a bigger audience. And three of the four will be joining us for the premiere. There's only Alicia Silverstone that isn't, and that's just because she's in America and yeah. we couldn't really justify her coming over. <laughs> yeah, fair so, enough. Um, <laughs> so we basically, I, um, yeah, yeah. it's funny how we bumped into them all, really. I, I just reached out to Peter Egan and he responded and said he'd love to. I sent him a yeah, like a rough cut of the film at the time. He really liked it, and he just hosted the Q and A at the premiere on April tenth. Then, with regards to Heather Mills, I happened to bump into her at Vegfest just randomly, mm. and I thought oh, this seems like a great opportunity for me to say, "I've got a film coming out, Heather." <laughs> <laughs> and um, <laughs> like, like to my surprise, my she was, I mean, she's lovely, and she was really keen to do anything she could to help. And then I sent her the film again and once she'd watched it, um, was happy to jump on board and she's doing some press for us and everything. So again, absolute, such a passionate vegan, which goes back to the point, everybody who we speak to really in the movement wants to help in some way. And with, uh, with Alyssa White Gloves, so I'm a, a big heavy metal fan. Yeah. And I, I've known of Alyssa for a long time and I just thought, wouldn't it be, I mean, I was like, this is probably a long shot, but uh, we reached out to our agent and just said, uh, it'd be great to get Alyssa involved in somewhere. We didn't know what it would look like at first. And to our you know, surprise, which um, we were thrilled about, she was more than happy to do anything she could to help the film. And she's, as I say, coming to the premiere as well. And then it was a similar thing with Alicia, uh, who was also uh, mega passionate and um, again, happy to be involved. So yeah, we just we just reached out to them and and explained a bit about what we were trying to do and how we really wanted to to have a, a huge impact with this and we we didn't want it to go under the radar and ultimately we wanted to reach as large a non-vegan audience as possible and so, and yeah, there were just everybody was super super happy to be involved and incredibly kind. No, oh, that's brilliant. It is it it can be like really really supportive and. Yeah, we we've worked with like Peter Regan and Heather Mills, and yeah, they've been really really great. Um, okay. With regards to the heavy metal, I think the opening shot, I was like Metallica t-shirt. Okay, good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy yeah, this. <laughs> Metallica, Iron Maiden, Led Zeppelin, I think ACDC. I get them all in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I do that on the mini shows. I'm always like sneaking something, and like Brutus was my most recent one. <laughs> yeah, um, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did, were there any, when you were filming the documentary, did you have any kind of challenges or anything like that that you faced or came up against? Oh, it, there was a lot, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we we had a pandemic in the middle of filming, which didn't help. So <laughs> uh, probably was such a long process. We, we were having to raise funds quite a lot, so we, we'd often run out of money, as, which this is quite common in the film industry in general, and then you have to go back and raise more funds and things. But we were fortunate that we had some really great and supportive financial backers who believed in what we were doing. Um, but largely it was, everything had to be stripped back when COVID hit. So we had a real, a really small crew, which kind of worked to our advantage to an extent because it, it everything felt slightly less formal and we could just do things at our own pace. So it, it did take a bit longer, but we knew we were doing them the right way and we weren't just rushing through things and, yeah, so it, it had its challenges, but we managed to um, kind of do it in a way where I think the end product hopefully benefits as a result. And then just the sheer amount of research. So I can't, we were so conscious that, I mean, if you pick any vegan film, and there's, there's so many amazing vegan films out there, but you're guaranteed to have some people who try to challenge some of the studies and stats and things. And one of the problems is sometimes stats, they they go out of date quite quickly. 
and unfortunately there's nothing you can do about that because the nature of making a film is you know we we finished filming over a year ago and then the, the entire year 2023 was post production you know by that point unless we were we were to take something out if things had changed it's like what's the right thing to do there so we were quite keen to basically be as as clear as possible on what we were saying and confident that it was going to stay that way but that meant it just took so long and we had to cross-reference everything. And, and like, I'm really pleased of, of what we actually managed to do. And um, we've had some comments when we've been sending around of, of just how you know detailed the studies are and the stats. But at the same time, it was a it, like a headache having to go through all of that. And uh, particularly my brother, again, um, so he, he largely took part of that area, which I'm glad about because I would not have enjoyed it. So, um, <laughs> Thank God so for that James. was definitely difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean it's true though. There were so many stats, but not in a like in a really well presented way. And it was like it felt like a very clear kind of this is what we're saying. These are the stats to back it up. And you know, like with Alice Brow and people like that, you've got real credible professionals as well who you know are respected. And so it does come across really, really well. It, I think it was worth the headache, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so just kind of like overall as well, what kind of ways are you hoping that, you know, this documentary is going to contribute to the kind of conversation around veganism and plant-based diets? Yeah, so, I mean, I really hope that we can get this to as many non-vegans as possible because ultimately that's who we're trying to reach. Um, but that's not to say vegans won't be um, in helpful in you know as doing that, of course, because vegans will promote hopefully and share this with friends, encourage uh, their non-vegan friends to come with them to see it and that kind of thing. But ultimately, it's about reaching as large an audience as possible before it's too late, and just trying to really make a difference. Because as it stands at the moment, we're we're on a ticking it's a ticking time bomb really, in t- especially if you're thinking about the climate in general and the environmental issues we face, but there's so many animals that are needlessly killed and there's, uh, you know, we just need to change that because it just, it's such an injustice that's taken place. And not to mention the crisis in terms of health that people are facing yeah. and the people needlessly dying. And so there's there's never been a more urgent time or more of a need for change than there is now. And ultimately we need to make sure we reach as big an audience as possible and actually have it so that they listen like so they're receptive yeah. to listen and that they're willing to change as a result of the information that we presented them and that's ultimately what we're trying to do with the film and hopefully we can uh, after the cinema run in the uk we can get it in various other territories worldwide make it as easy as possible to access uh, on the streaming platform and really initiate change and that's that's really what we're trying to do yeah absolutely it's it's so good i think that you'd be hard pushed to watch it and not think about it, even if it's like little changes with some people. I think, yeah, it, it's, I'd find it very hard to to not want to change, you know, on the spot having watched that. Um, but I mean, in your opinion, after everything that you've done with the documentary and all of the kind of conversations you had, is there any, any single argument that you can think of for people not to go vegan uh, well, I'll be completely honest. No, yeah. <laughs> there's not, not at all. Yeah. No, I can't, I cannot think of a single reason why people shouldn't go vegan. And it... um, I'm just sorry. I'm just going to jump in. I don't know. I've noticed that the sun's beaming through my head. Does that still oh, look okay? <laughs> <laughs> the sun's fine. It, it, you've got a kind of Jesus glow going on, but it's all right. <laughs> uh, there's it's, a it's all symbolic right. message there. <laughs> 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 But no, um, I, I honestly, I can't think of a single reason why people wouldn't go vegan. And we we really go to go into detail on the, the really big um, common myths and misconceptions that we hear. And like, I'm, I like to think that I'm kind of living proof that we don't need meat to survive. And I've never been at a disadvantage for anything in my life. Um, I've always been very sporty and active and I've always feel like I've competed at a, a decent level. Just for someone who you know does things as a as a hobby, you know runs as a hobby or uh, lifts weights or whatever. So, uh, and and also I, the, there's something around living as kind and compassionate a life as you can, and what that what that feels like. And it's hard to explain what that feels like to somebody who perhaps isn't attempting to do that, or or maybe they think yeah. they are, and this is the thing, but um, they're unwilling to 
accept that they're not at least at this moment in their life so i think yeah there's there's just there's no reason that i could honestly think of why anybody wouldn't wouldn't adopt this lifestyle other than sheer ignorance if we're if we're being honest yeah, i agree and and i think that's what the documentary does so well it's ah, yeah there's the cognitive dissonance there's a separation oh yeah you got your halo's gone <laughs> and then there's the uh <laughs> And then there's actually what, you know, in the documentary, you cover everything. And, you know, it is a testament. You are running around as well. You know, you're doing the run with that guy who's finished his day shift and he wants to run up the coast. And, oh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was insane. He'd done a full shift at work. I mean, that I, I was amazed at how reluctant he was to take a, a day's holiday for that. If ever there was need to take a day's holiday, yeah. it was when you were attempting to get an ultra running world record. But he thought, do you know what? I'm going to go to work and then I'll start my attempt at this two-day world record straight after my shift. <laughs> Vegan stamina right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Thank you so much for chatting to us today. It's been, yeah, it's, it's been an actual pleasure. So thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. I thank you for having me on. Um, I'm such a fan of the work that you do as well. So thank you for everything you do. And, uh, and also we feature some fever in the uh, in the film. Don't know if you're aware of that. So there's uh, yes. that too. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Yeah, it, it was like, yeah, it's a pleasure. We're a big fan and there's so many good documentaries at the moment and the movement seems to be like really taken off. So yeah, it's great. And if there's anything we can do in terms of like helping you to like promote it and things like that, we will. So uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. No, no worries. Thanks so much, Tom. <laughs>